Hey everybody, thanks for joining me here today for Exploring Black and White with Rick Salmon and Black and White Effects. I'm so excited to welcome him back with us. Um, he's going to be giving us a little presentation on the new plugin and then demoing how he is incorporating the black and white tools that are in this new black and white effects plug-in um, into his workflow and what, what he finds unique about it. I'm super excited to see how he's using it, so let me tell you a little bit about Rick first and then I will turn it over to him. Rick is a Canon Explorer of Light and um, a well known for his post-processing skills. He's published over 36 photography books and currently has six apps out including Rick Salmon's HDR portfolio and it's a great app so definitely check it out. He also has a great blog Rick Salmon's Digital Imaging Diaries and I'll definitely give that information out to you at the end of the webinar. Let's see here, I'll give you a little bit of technical information if you're having any trouble with your screen or the sound, usually logging off and logging back in, turning off anything that might be taking up a lot of memory or running flash on different uh, websites. You can just turn that off and that will usually help out. If you have any questions during the webinar, you can type them into the questions module on the GoToWebinar panel. Myself and Ashley Robinson, our product manager, will be online answering those. And then we'll be having a Q&A session with Rick after his presentation. So thanks, everybody, again for being here. And with that, I will go ahead and turn it over to Rick. So again, I want to thank, uh, I want to thank you guys out there. I want to thank Nicole. I want to thank Topaz Labs. But uh, speaking of Nicole, actually, Nicole loves the quad tones. I mean, and the quad tones really are very, very <laughs> cool, cool effect in, in black and white effects. You know, and I'm going to be getting getting to these later when we're doing a little, uh, a little demonstration. So this is uh, Nicole's picture down in the bottom right. So we're going to call Nicole quad tones uh, Pascal from and now on. <laughs> um, but as long as I have this picture of the cowboy up here, uh, I think that w whatever plugin you're using, that the subject, or H, or actually whatever the subject is, uh, the or the plugin, or the effect, or Lightroom, or Photoshop, whatever you're using, the subject really suggests the effect. Like this is true when it comes to HDR. If you're going to photograph like an old junkyard, you know, uh, a very grungy effect would look great. But if you're photographing Mount Rainier, where I was last week, you know, a natural look, so uh, would be good. So here, I really like this. You know, this like old time sepia tone. It's from the uh, if you look on the left, the Van Dyke, the Brown collection. And they fine-tuned it with the quad tones. Quad tones is in finishing touches, which we'll get to. But please keep that in mind, that the subject really suggests the effect. So, you know, I'm a professional. I use this professionally. But it's also, you know, a heck of a lot of fun. Here's a picture of my son, Marco. And what I did here in this picture, as you can see, he's in color, but the background's in black and white. So here's the full color picture. And here's the background in black and white. I'm going to be showing you guys how to do that. So well, again, this is going to be mostly about uh, black and white effects, but you can create some of these effects and create a different effect using Topaz Adjust. I'm going to be showing you how to do that. So the big question is, why black and white? You know, we all have uh, digital cameras that uh, you know capture this beautiful colors, this wide range of colors, super sharp details. Why the heck black and white? Well, <laughs> I'll tell you why. <laughs> because when you remove when you remove the color from a scene, you remove some of the reality. And when you remove some of the reality, your pictures can look more creative. And you know, look at the picture on the left. This looks a little more creative than the picture on the right. Same thing here. You know, Ansel Adams, one of the and Joseph Karsh. We, I'm going to be talking about them in a bit. You know, they use black and white to you know remove that reality to create you know one of a kind images. And this is what you can do with the black and white effects. So again, I'm going to be going through the effects. You see the different effects up on the top left. You have all these presets on the bottom left, and on the right you have your creative, uh, your creative touches. So if you're not feeling that creative, just click on an effect and press a preset, and away you go. But I know that you guys would not be tuning in from all around the world if you were not feeling creative. So I'm going to encourage you and show you how to use those effects on the right. So we have the traditional black and white effects like Harsh and uh, and uh, Ansel Adams created. You know, we have these creative effects where you can create these one of a 
kind, really cool effects, and you have artistic effects. So a black and white effects is really, yes, it's black and white, but it's also like black and white and color. So this is a really fun, cool plugin. So we have all these, you know, professional tools, but these can really help us awaken the artist within and see different tones. You can actually see different tones in a picture. And it's really, you know, when you look at a picture, it's really all about the light. Uh, when it comes to the light, it's the contrast range in the scene, the uh, direction of light, the color of light, and the quality of light. And then it comes down to the tones. If you look at the, uh, I photographed this uh, girl in Cuba, look at her jeans are different uh, tones. On the left, they're darker. On the right and, and, and in the middle, they're a little lighter. So we can control these tones individually and have a lot of fun. You can really create, you know, I mentioned Ansel Adams, I think, not a hundred times. <laughs> I mentioned him a few times. He, he was the master of black and white. Look at this black sky. This is what he strived to get in many of his pictures. I'm going to show you how to do this. So we can really create these dramatic images. Before I get going here, the filters are very, very important in black and white, in black and white effects, and in black and white photography. You know, I actually, I'm sure I'm older. I'm 61, than a lot of people listening, you know, I started out shooting black and white film. And I had to learn about a black and white filter. So I want you to do a search on black and white filters. But look at number 10 down here. It says to lighten an object, choose a filter, the same color as the object. You'll see how this works in, uh, in Topaz uh, black and white effects. So do a search, please, on Yosef Karsh, Karsh of Ottawa. Look at these dramatic pictures he has on the right there. Again, a master of black and white. And do a search on Ansel Adams. This picture looks a little grainy on the left because I just grabbed, I actually grabbed all the pictures uh, off the web. But learn how to see contrast because when we take the color out of the scene, then we're, we're really relying on, on tones and we're relying on, we're relying on contrast. So we really have to think differently. But what's really fun is, you know, when you're out there shooting, think in black and white. And when you start thinking in black and white, actually your color pictures may become a little better because you're seeing in different tones. And speaking of, uh, of light, this is my number one photography tip, that light illuminates shadows defined. Shadows are so important. I'll give you another uh, thing on shadows. You know, shadows can be your friend. Shadows are the soul of the pictures. Shadows add a sense of depth and dimension. So work with shadows. You know, we have all these programs that, that can, you know, open up the shadows. But I like working with the shadows. So that's it for the uh, live demo. only took uh, a few minutes. Where, I mean, for the uh, keynote show, we're going to get into the live demo now. And uh, over on the bottom, you see the Topaz uh, website. You see my website. Everyone who comes to uh, my uh, workshops and seminars is a student for life. So if you guys have any questions, you can uh, ask uh, me after the fact. Okay, so we're going to get going here. Since I had that black and white Ansel Adams type picture, actually he photographed this church in, uh, in this statue out in Santa Fe. I'm going to go like this. When you're working on an image, you should always have a nice plain background, whether you're working in Lightroom or Photoshop or Aperture or whatever, because you can get, get, get distracted by these other things uh, you know, going on. So let's play with Topaz. Let's go right down here to black and white effects, and let's see what we can do here. If we can create you know, that Ansel Adams type picture, which this is not. However, before I came on here, I was playing around with this uh, preset over here, the cyanotype. And what I was trying to do is I was trying to create a nighttime effect. So this picture now looks like it was taken by moonlight, right, on a beautiful moonlit night. The reason it looks like this is because whatever you did last is applied, and here's the original, by the way, is applied. So if you have like a bunch of pictures of this church and you want it to all look the same, you know, leave it. But I'm going to reset all. Here's my original image transformed into black and white. It looks pretty flat. That's right, I mean, if you guys are looking at it. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to go to, because the exposure is good. If your exposure is not good, you could play around with uh, what's going on up here. Your contrast, your brightness, who's the blacks, who's the whites. But speaking of contrast, actually, this is actually a very contrasty scene. So if I boost the contrast, you see I'm going to lose all the details over here. I mentioned uh, a few minutes ago that contrast is very important in, actually, I think it's more important in black and white photography than in color photography, because our eyes are a little forgiving in color. So I'm always looking to 
preserve these details in in the highlights. And this is one way uh, we can we can do it. We can play around here. We can protect the highlights a little more. Look at that. So look at those highlights. You know, it's kind of like HDR photography. In HDR photography, if you blow out the highlights, if your highlights are uh, overexposed and washed out, you defeated the whole pers purpose of HDR photography. If Ansel Adams was here, he wouldn't want those highlights uh, washed out, and I'm sure you guys don't either. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to go up here to my, uh, let me see where I want to go. I want to go to my color sensitivity. And I'm going to go down here. I'm going to play with the filter first. Okay, this is the, let me go back to here, the reset all. Look what happens if I just move this filter over here. If I move it to the blue filter, the sky gets a little lighter. Move it over, actually on the color sensitivity. I, I'm going down this color filter under the color sensitivity. This color filter, I'm moving it over here. So the sky's uh, not so bad, right? It's getting a little better. Look what happens when I go over here. Now the sky's getting nice, and look what happens when I move this. So this is the effect that Ansel Adams was getting, this nice, dark, black sky. So what I would suggest, guys, is when you're out there, you know, shooting, envision the end result. And by the way, if this cloud wasn't here, and this cloud wasn't here, this may not look uh, as, as cool and as good. But so, you know, this works very, very well on, uh, on, uh, on beautiful sunny days when we have nice clouds. So if I wanted to fine tune this a little more, I could go back to my basic exposure. Let me see if I boost the contrast just a bit. And look what happens if I just boost this a bit. It's a little too much. Now, I like pictures a little on the dark side. My wife likes pictures a little on the light side. So I'm going to do that. And if I want to do anything else to this picture, uh, I'll show you curves in a second because that's kind of cool. Let me shoot down here to finishing touches. And let me put a border on this. I'm going to put a solid white border on here because I'm going to show you how this makes the picture stand out. If you have, and I'm going to click OK. And let me go like this. So if you, look at that. So if you have a, a website with a black background, if you have a website or a blog with a black background, that white border will really make the, the picture stand out. If you have a, a website with a white background, like mine, uh, you might want to put a black border on it to make it stand out. But you know, Ansel Adams was really big on, on framing. Uh, so anyway, that's a quick look at that picture. Get rid of that and go to the next one. And uh, I don't know if it's Nicole is getting any questions, but I'm sure she is, and she'll be passing some of those along to me uh, later on. Let me, okay, let's open this picture. Let's go here to the full screen mode. And let's go to our filter. Let's go to Topaz Labs. Let's go to black and white effects. <clears throat> now, this is, see, this effect that I just used was applied over here. I'm going to press reset all to start all over again. This is kind of cool. I think you saw this girl in one of my other uh, Topaz uh, webinars. Uh, you know, I think we all have favorite pictures. This is uh, one of my favorite pictures that I took in Cuba. But if you're not, I'm going to be showing you uh, a different effect here. Uh, I'm sure you've seen fashion uh, and beauty magazines uh, or even some, some videos on, on TV where the subject is, and commercials, uh, where the subject is in color and the background, and the background is in black and white. This is very easy to do uh, here in, in these local adjustments. If I wanted to, you know, dodge an area, I could click this and, you know, dodge an area, but let's try this right now. Let's go to color, and you're going to see how cool this is. I'm going to want to just paint her. I want to get color, the original color, back in this girl. So I want the edges to be very, very sharp. So when I paint in here, her, her blue jeans, as you see up here, I don't, want the, I don't want to do the car. I want to do a hard edge brush, and I want to paint back in all the color, all the color. So this is what opacity does, and this is your brush size. So look at this. I'm just going around here. Again, this is the effect. I'm just painting this in. And if you see how cool this is, as long as you keep that X, those little crosshairs inside inside the main subject, and then I would be doing a better job, of course, if I'm doing this by myself. People from around the world weren't listening, tweeting. Tweet about this, by the way, if you want to, in your spare time. <laughs> I'm going to go over here. 
You see how it's not bleeding over here? This is, this is actually very, very cool. Now say it does bleed. Uh, hold on, let me just keep going here. Let me go down here a little bit. This shows you what I'm painting, by the way, right? Go back up here. Let me get my uh, brush size smaller here. So this is pretty cool. So try this. You saw that picture of my son in the beginning of this, you know, the, the post against that wall with the, uh, with the cat on it. Try this. You'll impress your friends. Now this is very cute for like, you, actually if you've been in the, uh, in the uh, supermarket or card store, I'm sure you've seen greedy cards like this, you know, a cute little girl, you know, holding a flower against uh, a black background. Uh, so you could, you could, you know, try the, try this effect. I think that looks pretty cool. Let me click OK. Not, well, I missed some there, but, uh, but you get the basic, and I, <laughs> I missed some on her face. Uh, let me get out of there. So, you, but you get the basic idea. Try this. It's a lot of fun. You know, with the holidays coming up, Halloween, you may want to do something like that. So when it comes to, you know, a black and white, you know, we could do beautiful black and white, create black and white portraits and black and white landscapes, as well as our fun shots, like I just showed you. So let's do something a little more serious. I start with the fun stuff because, that's right, I like to have a lot of fun. So I'm going to go down here to Topaz Labs, black and white effect. I want to create now, try to create, uh, Car Shavadwa. You know, I mentioned a few minutes ago that I'm older than most of the people listening. I actually interviewed Karsha of Ottawa in 1979 when I was the editor of a magazine called uh, Studio Photography. Uh, he was really a, a master and a true gentleman. Uh, you see that this picture probably doesn't need, oh, this is actually probably cool, actually kind of cool. If you don't know what something does, just hold your mouse or your stylus over it. It'll tell you what it does. So I, actually, I'm using the, the Wacom tablet here with a with stylus. If you're serious about your work, you want to get one of these tablets, which is why I was able to paint that girl. Again, <laughs> I would have done a better job and not missed the stuff on her face and on her toes. Uh, I would have uh, yeah, seen that and, and fixed that up. But if you really want to paint like that, you want to get a stylus. You really want to get a, a tablet and a stylus. So let's go. let's start with the conversion here. This has maybe a little too much contrast here, so I'm just going to reduce the contrast. See, if we boost the contrast, we lose detail. Uh, same thing if we oversaturate part of an image. If we oversaturate part, let me start again, oversaturate part of an image, we lose detail. Go to the adaptive exposure here. So I want to protect the highlights, okay? So look at, I have now some more detail in this man's shirt, and I've protected some of the highlights. If I want to get that Karsh look, you know, if you saw that, look at now we're getting some, the pores in his face now are really showing up. Uh, I don't want to go back to the, uh, to the keynote, but if you do a search, look at that picture of Hemingway, Ernest Hemingway, that, that Karsh took. You see, you can see every, every hair on his head, like you can see up here, and, uh, and every pore on his face. So, you know, this, you wouldn't want to make a picture this sharp if you were doing like a baby portrait, of course. Uh, but if you're photographing a sexy senior citizen like, like this man, you would, want to, uh, you would want to do that. Let me show you the, uh, so anyway, I, this, this picture really doesn't need that much. Uh, when, you're, when you're playing around here, once you pick, uh, you know, one of these collections here, if you just scroll over here, you'll see, look up at the top left, you'll see these, these change. And speaking of uh, what's going on over here, this platin, platinum collection. This is, this is one of the, the updates. This is really cool. You know, uh, I've, been, I've been to uh, shows where you know, platinum prints, people are making platinum prints. Platinum prints actually would sell for more than, than a standard print. So play around with these uh, platinum. I like this uh, platinum here. Well, let me see if I want to do anything over here. I don't think, uh, I don't know. I'm happy with the picture. You know, just because you have all these tools, <laughs> it doesn't mean that you have to do something. Because sometimes, you know, if you start playing with all this stuff, like say, oh, a great way to increase contrast is the contrast is to boost curves. You boost the contrast and you lose the uh, the detail. But I do want to show you that curves tool because curves is actually very very cool. Let me go here. Let me go to a filter. 
Okay, there's labs, black and white effects. What's going on over here? It's taking a little while. There we go. Okay, so I'm going to do a reset. So this picture is nice enough, but here, again, people say, oh, what's the workflow in, you know, black and white effects? Or what's the workflow in Lightroom? What's the work workflow in Photoshop? Well, I don't have any set workflow uh, except I think in, in when I'm working in black and white, I am thinking about the contrast range. So I'm going to go here. I'm going to go to my curves tool. Um, you know, I could uh, change the contrast up here, right, just by boosting the contrast like that. Hey, look at that. Look at the sky. Look at the detail. When you boost the contrast, your blacks become blacker and your whites become whiter. So your picture has, that's right, uh, more contrast and more detail. It also can increase the apparent sharpness of a picture. So let me reset that and let me go down to uh, curves. Let me see where this is, the curve tool. So this is the best way to do it, I think. And I, I, I don't, don't know if I did this the last time uh, you guys were here, but when I teach uh, you know, any plugin or when I teach uh, Photoshop, when I teach Lightroom, I'm doing, the, I, I'm doing the same thing. You want to create what's called an S-curve, okay? And whoop, let me reset this. So what you want to do is you put a little dot there, and you, look at that. You just create a little S-curve. So this helps pr to, to protect the highlights and the shadows. Otherwise, when you just do the uh, increase the regular contrast, what happens is you're not protecting those highlights and the shadows. And if you need if you need a, a way to remember that S-curve, think about this Ansel Adams picture over here. This is an S-curve. When you're composing a picture, this S, an S-curve is one of the uh, main uh, composition techniques. As long as I'm here, look at, look at the detail. Again, it's a small picture, but if you could find a larger picture, you could see every pore, every hair on, uh, on Ernest, Ernest Hemingway's hair. hair. <laughs> here, there. Okay, so let's see what else we can do here. Okay, we've increased the contrast. Let's go down here to our color filter. Okay, look at that nice black sky. We're getting like kind of like the Ansel Adams sky. Let's go to our color sensitivity. Let's boost our blues. Okay, let's take a little, the larger the file, by the way, the longer it takes. So what I would suggest, if you're new to this, maybe one of the things you, you want to do Oops, I went the wrong way. One of the things you want to do is maybe make, you know, don't, don't import, you know, the largest tips on the planet. <laughs> make, uh, make smaller JPEGs and play around with that so you can, if you're as hyper as I am anyway, uh, I'm sure you can tell this, uh, uh, it'll, it, the process will go a lot faster. So here's our original, you know, nice, nice enough, right? Popping with color. And, but look at this. This is more, again, like a classic black and white picture. I took this at the uh, Pemaquiba Lighthouse uh, up in Maine. Actually, they call it a light. They don't call it a lighthouse. But a, a fun composition technique, or an interesting composition technique, is to frame a picture for a, a cover of a magazine. So here I left dead space up here for like the name of the magazine and left some space uh, down here. Uh, just another tip on this. I could give you a million, but here, I use a polarizing filter. A polarizing filter reduces the glare on the water. It darkens a, a blue sky, makes the white clouds look a little lighter, but it does something else. A polarizing filter, which by the way is the only filter I use uh, outdoors, I remove all the other filters and apply them uh, digitally. A polarizing filter can actually make your pictures look sharper. Why? Because, I'm glad you asked. <laughs> Why? Because, uh, the polarizing filter can reduce glare on atmospheric haze. So that's why your pictures can look sharper. So I, as you can see here, here's the platinum. Uh, I could probably get to kind of like the same effect using, uh, using boost the blacks here, using some of these. So as you can see, by the way, you know, you're working in a black and white program, right? Plug in. You're working in a black and white plugin, but what's important? Well, the color sensitivity. And you know, I, again, I learned about this by using, you know, color filters on black and white. This is why I stress that I really want you to read about uh, color filters because 
you know, it's just like if you want to photograph people, read a lot about how to photograph people. It's just not, you know, the, the technique of, you know, pointing your camera at a person. So it's very, very important to do that little uh, homework assignment that I, I showed you. Okay, let's move on. I mentioned, uh, let's go to this guy because I showed him before. So I was, I was uh, Nicole and I were getting ready for this, and she says, well, where'd you take a picture of the man, you know, in the car? Well, actually, this is a dummy of uh, Humphrey Bogart. I took this down in uh, South Beach, Miami. I'm doing a workshop there, by the way, in January. If any of you guys are in the Florida area want to join the uh, photo fun. But again, as I said before, I think, you know, the subject dictates, that's too strong. The subject suggests the effect. So I don't want to use, this is an HDR picture, by the way, I don't want to use a traditional uh, black and white effect. I want to really, I really want to have some fun with this. So I'm going to go to black and white effects here. I guess I didn't downsize this picture. So this looks kind of cool, right? Just like this. I can go to my conversion, go to my basic exposure. I want to make this a little brighter. That's one way to do it. But let me go down to my curve tool. And, and this is what I do in, uh, in uh, Photoshop or Lightroom. If you just pull the center of the curve up to the top left, your picture becomes over, overall brighter. Down to the bottom right, you know, this is why I say I like pictures a little darker. My wife likes them a little lighter. I'm pulling this down to the uh, bottom right. You know, I'm kind of liking, I'm kind of liking uh, that. But this is a traditional black and white effect. But South Beach is so cool. You know, talk about wildlife. This is this place, you know, doesn't get going till midnight. Let's see what we can do here with this Van Dyke Brown collection. And you know, and the way you, you get good at this, by the way, here you can see, I'm just scrolling over again with my stylus, these different effects. I kind of like this coffee effect, okay? Hey, you know, that looks kind of cool. It's like out of a movie scene. It's like out of an old movie. You know, the most important thing in a picture it's not, well, it's not really the, the highlights. It's not really the, uh, the HDR effect. It's not really the shadows. The most important thing in a picture, and we were talking about this last week in Mount Rainier when uh, people were uh, you know, photographing during my workshop. I said the most important thing is the mood of the picture. The most important thing is the tone of the picture. So you get into all these effects, but think about that end result. Think about what mood, what effect do I want to get? So again, this is kind of like what I want, but I'm going to play around with what Nicole uh, Quattones <laughs> suggests. If you scroll down here, if you're not totally happy with the effect, this is amazing. Actually, there's two things that are amazing that's built into this very affordable program. Uh, Quattones are in Photoshop, okay? And I, I could show you in a second here uh, where they are and how you get to them. It's a little hard to understand for the, for the beginner. Uh, curves is also in Photoshop, and it's a little hard to, to understand. Uh, that, that these two great features, you know, um, quad tones and curves, are in this affordable prog program is just amazing to me. So you see these uh, numbers over here? This goes from like zero, right, to 255. These are all the tones. So look, at it. I can I can play around with all, with these sliders here. If I want to make this tone lighter, I can do that. If I want to play around here, if I want to move this here, if I want to go all the way over here, I may not like that effect. But this is like that. You know, you want to you want to experiment. You want to practice. You could also get a, a color just by clicking on this and changing changing around. But just to give you an example of let me cancel. So anyway, I kind of like this. So the point here is play with your traditional effects, play with your different settings, and then, as I said, if you're not feeling creative, just stick over here. But these finishing touches, putting this, this quad tone on here is really kind of cool. If you want to get here in, uh, in Photoshop, you have to go image mode, you have to go to grayscale, click uh, discard, then you have to go to image uh, adjustments and uh, where was it? Where is it? Where is it? Image, adjust, here, uh, image mode here. It's duotone right here. They have duotones, quadtones, and tritones grouped all together. Then I would click in here and then do, do and do and do all this stuff. 
See, I, I could get a duotone going here and get another color, but you really have to know what you're doing. If you're a professional graphic artist and you're working in a magazine who wants an exact uh, color picture uh, or quad tone or tritone or duotone picture, which is actually kind of like a color picture, not a full color picture, that's a good way to do it. But again, th that this is available at the, at the touch of a button uh, or a click of a mouse and a little slider, that's, uh, that's amazing to me. I heard Nicole typing in the background. Nicole, uh, should I just keep going or have any questions? I do have questions. Do you want me to go ahead and, and ask those now, or did you want to go ahead with this image? We have... Um... Well, well, I have one more. Okay. And again, I showed, I showed this before. Actually, I have more. But, um, so here, we have this traditional effect. We have local adjustments. If you're, let me press reset. See, you always have to press that uh, reset. We saw this girl in the, in the last, uh, actually my neighbor's daughter, she's the girl with the pearl hair and has become quite famous after that. Uh, we saw this in color and what we can do with color, but let's talk about this local adjustment again. Look at the detail in a scarf, the detail in this scarf, the detail here. You know, I worked hard to get this detail. By the way, it's just one light, uh, a Canon 580X flash uh, placed in a softbox. A West Cut Apollo softbox, and you could do so much with one light. Uh, here's my advice. If you think you need two lights, use one light. If you think you need three lights, use one light. <laughs> See what you can do with one light before you start uh, adding lights. But let's check out the smooth feature here. I'm going to go to the overall strength here. Okay, I'm going to boost this up. I'm going to do the edge aware again because I don't want to you know, bleed into this area. And I'm going to do the opacity. And look at this. Right now, I'm just smoothing her skin. She's a teenager, right? <laughs> so I've, I've smoothed her skin. Here's the original. You can see um, that she is a, she's still beautiful, but just a couple of little details that I want to get out. So look at that. We have a nice, beautiful portrait. If I wanted to bring back some of the color, like I was talking about before, you know, I could do that. I don't know if it works as, actually, I know it doesn't work as well on this image. And actually, you see I bled over here. I bled into a skin here. That's because I didn't have this edge aware all the way over there. But fear not. You have the eraser. So I could make my brush size a little smaller and, uh, and then erase that if I wanted to. But let me show you this. If I go to here, Topaz Labs, if I go to Topaz Adjust 4, I can go to a portrait smooth here and I can take out the saturation and get a nice picture there. But watch this, if I just add a little bit of color back in. You know, when, when the Kodak and Fuji first introduced their saturated films, I don't know, 20 years ago or more, everybody wanted super saturated pictures. Here's the black and white picture, but look what happens when we add just a touch of, just a little bit of color. Again, we're taking out some of the reality from the scene. We're making our pictures look a little more creative, a little more artistic. Let me close this. And uh, Nicole, do you want to go ahead with the question? Sure. All right. Let's just start up from the beginning. If you have any questions uh, for Rick, you can type them into your questions module on your GoToWebinar panel. And we'll try to answer as many as we can here in the next 20 minutes or so. Okay, first, Stu would like to know, let's see here, he says, would you characterize yourself principally as a fine art photographer, or do you do other sorts of work? And he's just trying to understand kind of where you are in the art world, I guess. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, thanks for that question, Stu. I don't think I'm really in the art world. Uh, <laughs> but, you know, you, you can create works of art. You know, I had an exhibit in, in, in Soho last December, which was a, a lot of fun. Uh, but I don't really consider myself in the art world. Although, you know, before Photoshop and Lightroom and, and all the plugins, I never thought I was really and could create artistic type pictures. But as you see here, with this picture here of this cowboy, you know, we can really create. We can really create. You know, artistic looking pictures and. And I think I kind of, I, I took it a little bit uh, to the side of what he was actually asking. I'm sorry. He's kind of more along the lines of your, how you put yourself in the photography world, whether you're fine art or more commercial, yeah. et cetera, that type of. 
Uh huh. Well, I answer that by saying uh, this. Um, <laughs> my specialty is not specializing. So I'll do pictures like this here. That if we if we look at this, okay, you know, and uh, when we do the full screen mode here, it's almost say, oh, look at the detail. We can see every hair uh, in the mustache. We can see all the the uh, the detail on the rope. We can see every pore on his face and his uh, and his uh, laugh lines and all that. Uh, I tell, but so I could create you know a nice picture like that. But as you saw, you know, in my little keynote show. I like to have you know a lot of fun too, so um, I tell people and and I I tell people you know in photography it's the same as as your investments you know the stock market hasn't been doing that great lately, um, well you know I'm so diversified it doesn't really matter and it's the same thing in photography if you're diversified if you do your fine art if you do fun, if you do you know if you do portraiture if you do landscapes if you give webinar do webinars uh, if you have apps like I do and books and blah 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 uh, if you don't specialize, I think, today in photography. I think that's a good idea. However, that's not to say someone who wants to be a food photographer just should not focus on uh, <laughs> not should not focus on on food photography. But I'll tell you, you know, the, the reason everyone is listening, the reason everyone is got into photography is because you know you you wanted to have fun and you you wanted to have fun, which is why you got into photography. And the reason you're listening is because you want to have fun, <laughs> and you probably want to make some money. Uh, some of you may want to do that. So if you have an exhibit, you know, try a black and white exhibit like this picture. You know, I'm sure a lot of people have seen, you know, a, a color picture of this. But if you go to, you know, if you have a have a picture like this, this really pops. Someone's going to walk. If you say you're in a local coffee shop, this picture is going to pop off the wall because of the contrast. We're not used to seeing pictures like this. You know, when Photoshop came out. People say, "Oh, you're cheating! You know, you're doing this with Photoshop. You're doing that with Photoshop." You know, when I first started teaching it, and what I used to say, I say, "Well, then Ansel Adams was the biggest cheater because he took the reality out of the scene. He made the sky black. It doesn't look like that." <laughs> so, uh, but uh, just one more thing on that: if uh, the person listening, to Stu, wants to, um, uh, you know, follow a particular follow a particular area, I would say follow your heart. All right, thank you. Um, let's see here. Rosalie has a question. She says, do you ever process images in other Topaz filters before processing it back into black and white effects? Well, I haven't done that yet. But uh, what I was, because yeah, I could do that. So we could take this filter. So the, the question is other ones, right? Mm -hmm. So let's go to Topaz Adjust 4. Uh, Let's go to uh, HDR. What's the HDR pop? HDR pop. Click OK. And then let's go to filter. Let's go to Topaz Labs. Let's go to black and white effects. Boy, this sounds like a set of question almost, doesn't it, Nicole? Because <laughs> it was. No, no, I know it wasn't. But here, let's go to the platinum collection. And uh, you know what? Which one might look nicer? The stylized collection, dark grunge. Yeah, this looks kind of cool. It looks different. Or uh, Graphic Dreams, you know? It, it's up to you. You know, we, we were put on the spot here, but as you can <laughs> see, you know? Well, kind of following along with this, um, yeah, yeah. I believe it was Jack asked, do you have a pre-black and white effects workflow, or do you, do you have a suggestion, like, um, do you do any processing beforehand? Right, like straight out of the camera. Mm -hmm. Well, actually, that's that's a very good uh, that's a very good question. So let's take uh, let's take this picture here for example. What you want to do is first thing you have to get the best in camera exposure, which means you want to check your histogram. the uh, The little monitor on the back, the LCD monitor, is not going to tell you really what your exposure is. Your histogram is. So you want to check your histogram. Aha! <laughs> Look at this. This is not a bad histogram. I have details all the way over to the. I was a little nervous there. A little <laughs> over to the right. I have all the way over to the right. I have details. I have. I have uh, details all the way over to the shadow. So this is what you want your histogram to look like. You want to have a complete range of pictures, a complete range of uh, of tones here, brightness levels. What you don't want is you don't want to spike over here. If you have a spike over here. 
you're going to have these highlights blown out, like right over here. And this is a layer, again, I mentioned this before with HDR and with the contrast. You don't want those highlights blown out. So the first thing I do is I check the histogram. When I open my picture in um, Lightroom or, or, or wherever, you know, I'm checking. That's one of the first things I do. Again, I check the, I check the, uh, the histogram. Let me go back to Telpaz Labs here. See, this is why you have to press uh, reset. Let me go to tra traditional effects. And uh, let me go to this conversion because I want to show you something, this color sensitivity here. I know I showed you before. So watch what happens to this. See the red up there? So this got like a little darker. So look for the different tones again in your picture when you're playing with this. And this will actually, I think, make you a better photographer. This is kind of like, you know, a self-taught lesson. If you if you look at what you're doing and remember, oh, this is what the red filter does. This is what the uh what the uh what the blue filter does. This is what the green filter does. Uh, this is what playing with the sensitivity. So it, it may sound funny or interesting that we're working in um black and white program, but we're really thinking about these color tones, you know, but but that's really what it's uh that's really what it's all about. All right. So we also. No, don't really, oh, sorry. <laughs> go ahead. No, go ahead. No, no. I was saying it really depends on the image as far as the uh, as far as the uh, workflow. Okay. Um, we have another question. Mm -hmm. um, do you? I'm I'm not sure if you do actually. Do you have a black and white book that you've published? I don't. Well, I don't have a. <laughs> that's funny. Uh, I don't have. <laughs> Well, I'll tell you why I'm laughing. I don't have a, a black and white book, but if I were going to do a, a project on black and white, I would uh, I would do an app. You know, apps sell all over the world. Uh, they're cheaper. You know, an app is like five bucks compared to like a thirty dollar book. A thirty dollar book here, as a, some of the listeners from around the world may know, my thirty dollar book here is uh, sixty dollars in Australia and England. So an app wow. for five bucks is really the way to go. So I think I have seven apps now, and actually some of my Macs, some of my apps work on a Mac, which is uh, which is kind of cool. I, and they're on my on my blog. Okay, let me kind of scroll down here for a minute. Wait, while you're scrolling down, let me just uh, share because I, I want to, you know, when we're looking at a picture, when, when you're done with a picture, I like to look at a picture uh, against a black background. But you're getting back to Joseph Karsh, his uh, his main uh, saying was the eyes of the window to the soul. So he took credit for this, but actually it was a Greek saying, <laughs> but it's attributed to Joseph Karsh. So eyes, look at this man. This man is looking right at you. Yes, he's looking at me, but I took this picture. So uh, when I showed it, pe people would say, man, that man is looking right at me. Another tip, if you want the viewer to relate right to the picture, right to the subject in the picture. You want to shoot eye to eye. You want to see eye to eye. I'm exactly at eye level here. Uh, you know, when you're photographing, say you're photographing the Sports Illustrated swimsuit model, you know, you have a chance. Uh, if you shoot a little lower, it gives the model a little more, a greater sense of, uh, of power. Um, so, but basically, if you want the subject, same thing here. I'm shooting at, at eye level. The girl uh, in Cuba is looking right at me. Same thing here, shooting at eye level. You can shoot down to, again, give the person a greater sense of uh, power, but the thing you don't want to do is you don't want to shoot like up, like into the nostrils. And I've seen lots of pictures like that. <laughs> uh, let's see here. We also have a few questions on your personal workflow and your um, cameras. What kind of cameras were used to shoot this, or do you have a multitude of them? Yeah, well, I used to have a top. I'm a Canon Explorer of Light. I'm very proud to be a Canon Explorer of Light. Um, I used to have the top of the line cameras, but because I don't shoot very fast-paced sports and very fast-paced uh, action, uh, my prime cameras now are the Canon 7D for action and the Canon 5D. The 5D is a full-frame image sensor camera. So with that, with that camera, I can use, utilize that, that fisheye fish eye lenses to get the full frame fisheye effect. Mm -hmm. With the 7D, I put the telephoto zoom lenses on there. I have almost exclusively zoom lenses uh, because I want that 100 millimeter lens to act 
to act like a longer to act like a longer lens. Um, I can't go on my blog, right, uh, Nicole? Because it'll slow. It'll yeah, it'll freeze everything up. Yeah. <laughs> well, we Sorry. I, have some, I have some pictures uh, that I just took in Mount Rainier, my latest picture showing the, the, the wide angle effect. So anyway, I use those two lens, those two cameras. I use primarily uh, zoom lenses. I have a my favorite lens is a Canon 24 to 105 millimeter image stabilization lens. And for wildlife, it's the uh, 100 to 400 millimeter image stabilization lens. Okay, thanks. Um, Mike would like to know, and actually quite a few people have been asking about infrared. He wants to know if you personally look at infrared the same or different from standard color to or black and white using this program from, from black and white effects yeah. view. Well, 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 that's interesting because when you, here, let me go here, going back to this shot. If I, I guess a lot of people are talking about they have an actual infrared converted camera. Right. Yeah. Light Pixel. Light Pixel does uh, mm -hmm. does the infrared uh, conversions, um, and I have a little I have a little uh, Canon point and shoot uh, compact camera that I converted to uh, to infrared. Let me go down to my curve, so to infrared only. When you start shooting infrared, if you're out there with your little camera. You start to see the sky is black. Um, so I used to, re I really used to be into infrared, and I was out west, and every everywhere I looked, I saw the sky is black. And this is what I was saying, actually, pretty much towards the beginning of this, that if you shoot black and white, if you want to envision black and white, you're going to you're going to start to see in black and white, just like infrared photographers see in infrared. So anyway, I have one of these cameras, so and, and they're great. Uh, and they make infrared uh, real easy. What's really important when you shoot infrared is that color swap, the red and blue channels in uh, in Photoshop to get those different effects. And for people who are new, and not not aware of these cameras that you can have converted to infrared, they basically are several different types of infrared uh, conversions, like to vivid, to normal, to this, to that, whatever. So be careful uh, uh, in your choice. Oh, by the way, as long as I'm up here, I forgot to tell you this, that you have this uh, histogram behind your curve tool. So this could, I remember I showed you that histogram for uh, for my image before the Pemaquib light, uh, that it was like all the way over here. So here you could see that you know, my highlights could be like, I, I could have moved this a little over. And speaking of that, when you're shooting, uh, you really want to move the histogram and when you're looking at the back of your camera, if you take your shot and check in your shot, you want to move that histogram to the right. If you want to learn about this, do a do a search on Google. Uh, and speaking of Google, get on Google Plus because Google Plus, I mean, this is amazing. This is like the coolest. Uh, latest, I mean, I think by January I may be just totally on on Google Plus. There's a link on uh, link on my site. But uh, do a Google search on move the histogram to the right. And you'll see how important this is when you're shooting, because if you have your histogram all the way over here, you block up the shadows. And in reality, and this is what you'll find when you do the Google search on, uh, on, uh, on move the histogram to the right, is that most of the detail when you're looking on the back of your camera is over here on the right. This is why you definitely want to be more to the right than more to the left. So I go off on a little bit of a tangent there, but seeing the histogram behind the curves, which is really cool. Uh, got me thinking about that. Thank you all for joining us from all over the world and for writing in from where you're coming from. That's a lot of fun. So thank you, Rick, and I hope you're able to join us again soon. Thank you, Nicole, and thank you, everybody. And uh, take care and uh, awaken the artist within. Thanks, Rick.